Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real genius. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Quick note about the foundation. We've started on our project to um, come up with every possible treatment for anxiety and depression. And the way we're doing this is we're going to be going through you know, thousands of peer-reviewed papers, lectures, books, interviews with sufferers, interviews with mental health professionals. The goal is to create a low-cost or no-cost resource for people suffering from anxiety and depression. So if that uh, is of concern to you, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and check out the project. Today, my guest is Fernando Alvira. He's an honorary research associate, part of the University of Bristol uh, in the Murphy Group. We're talking about camels, the Arabian camel, Camelus dromedarius. Looks like Fernando is doing some work researching the kidneys of these camels and learning how they conserve water, but I'll let him speak about that. So, Fernando, thank you for coming. Hi, Richard. Thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here today. Yeah, you're working on something unusual. How did you uh, get to study what you're studying? How did, how did camels get involved? I guess it's a bit of a long story. I I studied biology in, in Spain, in my hometown in Spain, and then moved to Norway to complete my master's degree in animal physiology, where I mostly studied how physiological adaptations allow these animals that live up north to thrive under extreme environments. And I mostly focus on adaptations to cold and extreme photo period. I specifically did some research on how hooded seals live without access to fresh water. So I, I was trying to elucidate whether these animals actually drink seawater or not. So it was pretty much then what I was very interested, I got very interested into understanding how these animals living in such a uh, extreme environments actually cope with them. So after I completed my master's degree, I work in a couple of places. And in 2019, I took up this position at Bristol University in uh, Professor Murphy's lab, as, as you said, and I started to investigate the transcriptomes and proteomes of the dromedary during dehydration and rehydration, which is obviously a completely different species, but a, a fairly closely related topic. Are you looking at epigenetic changes? Are you looking at, I mean, what are you looking at? You're looking at it when, right before the camel is about to drink or right when it's full of water? Like, when are you observing it? So the, the experimental design was that we kept five camels dehydrated for 20 days. And then there was a second, a control group, of course, and, a, and another group that was uh, dehydrated for those same 20 days and then rehydrated right after for three days. So after those two periods, after 20 days of dehydration and after 20 days plus three days rehydration, we took kidney samples and looked at how genes were regulated after you know spending that time deprived of water and see how the, how the genes changed according to those conditions. Well, I hope they weren't too too tough on the camels. Did they give them any water or the camels okay or 
And no, not at all. Like, experiment. Yeah, so that, that's one of the key points in this in this experiment. So the Murphy Lab has a long-standing expertise in, in investigating neuroscience. And more specifically, they they will look into the mechanisms involved in the hypothalamic control of body fluids. And they do most of the work in, in rats. Uh, but obviously, and I absolutely agree, ethical committees don't allow to subject rats to more than three days of dehydration, which is absolutely understandable because they, you know, they, that takes a toll with the rats. But with the camels, the, the possibilities are completely different. You can have these camels without any access to water for 20 days, and they are absolutely fine. No signs or, or of distress, illness, or nothing at all. They, they are absolutely fine. So that also allows you to, to look at this system when it's at its very limit. Um, and that gives you the possibility to find maybe new genes that you will miss in rats because you cannot push the limit that hard and maybe unravel different mechanisms that we didn't know before. How long can uh, dromedary or Arabian camels, how long do they go without water typically? Well, they can, they can stay three weeks without drinking any water easily. No, no problem at all. In nature, it's, it's very difficult to find that, of course, because they obviously tend to drink as much as they can, as much as they find. Uh, and they also eat during that time. So even though the, this might be shrash and some really dry plants that they find in the desert, there's, there's still some water in that food. But they can easily stay healthy without water for up to three weeks. Okay. What's the difference between dromedary and Arabian camels? How are they? I mean, yeah. they're, they're different species. Like, how different are they? No, it's the same species. So we've got the one half Arabian camel and the dromedary camels are the same species. We've got Bactrian camels, which are the two half camels. So those are basically mm. sort of two species. It's a, it's a bit confusing because it's not completely clear whether the Bactrian camel is divided into two species, or if one of the, those was domesticated and, and was like became wild again after some time. But yeah, basically, dromedaries, one hand, or even camels have one hand, obviously. Bactrian camels have two. Okay. So wh what did you discover when you looked at the, uh, the camels before and after they had water? So first of all, well, these kind of experiments really focus at the beginning on, on looking at the whole picture, the whole transcriptomic and proteomic profile of the kidney after under those experimental conditions. So it's tricky at the beginning to find or to look after something specific. You look at hundreds of genes and hundreds of proteins that change because these differences in the in the hydration status. And once you've got this list, massive lists of, of genes, you try to figure out pathways uh, that might be enriched, pathways that might, might be more important than others. So one of the things that we uh, found out is that a small depletion of cholesterol in the kidney tissue allows the camel to uh, conserve more water because when you deplete cholesterol from these tissues, the, the transmembrane transport ions and water, which is absolutely key in the kidney, especially during dehydration. It's favor, it's, it's more easy to, to move those ions and that water across the membrane and that allows the camel to, to conserve more water. And that was, that was very interesting, something that, yeah, as far as we know, has never been mentioned before in the literature. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from $10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. What did you discover? The, the porosity of the membrane changed? The... 
a mat of material moving across it, or was the material that could move across it different? What was different? So there are a few things that change when you reduce the level of cholesterol in the membrane. You, you, to begin with, you decrease the rigidity of the membrane. So that allows ions to diffuse through the membrane more easily. And then there are also a few uh, ion transporters and water transporters that are directly affected by the levels of cholesterol. So, for example, when you reduce the levels of cholesterol in the cell, you see an increase in the amount of aquaporin-2 that is traffic to the membrane. And aquaporin-2 basically transports water from the kidney, from the, from the lumen of the nephron into the tissue, and then that is transported into the, the bloodstream. So it's recovered. So there are yeah, different ways in which the amount of cholesterol affects uh, water conservation and ion movement. So what to, have you studied camel's humps in general? Do you know much about their anatomy and how the how the water gets conserved? I mean, what do you know about them? Not really in this project. So there is there is a fairly large literature in, in camel physiology. Most investigations are using a so-called classical approach where you know they, they look at the tissues and, and whether they drink or how much they drink. All the anatomy of the of the nasal cavity is very important, the, the structure of the kidneys. So in this case, we didn't focus on, on, on that. And we took this uh, genomic approach and she tried to identify think important genes could be key in, in preserving water. So that's basically what, what we've done. So what, um, how did you even get an inkling that cholesterol would be changed or altered or lowered when the camels were you know, in a dehydrated state? Who designed this? Like, how, how was this experiment designed? How was it contemplated? It's a bit, I, I guess it's a, a little bit the other way around. So you get all this transcriptomic data and when you analyze it bioinformatically, you get that, or, or we, we saw that the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway was uh, severely suppressed. So most of the genes called in for enzymes that, that have important roles in the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway were significantly downregulated in dehydration or in dehydrated comets. And there was a couple of papers that had mentioned that before. They didn't pursue that any further. Yeah, there were a couple of papers mentioning that cholesterol or, or some of the enzymes could be important in dehydration. So we followed that lead when we found out that in camels, the vast majority of those enzymes were downregulated. And then we, yeah, as I said, followed that lead, uh, measured cholesterol in the kidney and see that, that was decreased in the cell membrane. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. But in general, like what, what is the camel's body doing as, you know, once it fills up on water, as it progresses through dehydration, what is its body doing? Have you guys figured that out? Well, if you mean uh, physiologically, there are several studies in you know early days that show that, uh, first of all, some of the systems are shut, like uh, they eat less, they start to burn fat because that produces a lot of water. They also behave very, try to find the shade, move a lot less. They stop reproducing if they're severely dehydrated. They do a bunch of stuff to preserve, preserve as much water as, as, as possible. And of course, the kidney are absolutely essential. These camels can produce very highly concentrated urine to preserve a lot of water when they have no access to yeah, drinking water. I'm sure you don't want to take care of a camel when it's been dehydrated and it has to has to go to the bathroom. It's probably pretty gross. Do they stop going to the bathroom at some point? I mean, what happens as they as they're searching for water and it's taking longer to find? Yeah, really, very little. Yeah, they they produce very little urine, very concentrated. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now that you've seen that cholesterol is downregulated, and that's I guess making the membrane what more permeable or less rigid. You said like what what are some of the other things that are happening? Well, at this point, that's a bit of work in progress. We continue. It's it's one of the, I guess, pros and cons of this type of analysis. You could mine the data for ages if you wanted. So we continue working on this data and mining new information that will hopefully be yeah published in, in more papers. But it, it's hard to say what else they do okay. just looking at the genes. It's, it's something we're looking into uh, as we speak. Well, have they, you identified the particular genes that have been downregulated? And has anyone, you know, figured out, oh, okay, all right, this gene does this, this one does this, and because they're downregulated, uh, it looks like this and that has happened. Yeah, so in this case, in, in the cholesterol case, it's the whole pathway that is downregulated. So basically, there are 
around 15 enzymes that are key for the cholesterol synthesis that are downregulated in dehydration. But of course, there are with, within the list of the differential express genes, we've got these 15 cholesterol genes, but we've got another 500 maybe. Some of them are, you know, like they get, it's like common suspects or like aquaporins, some ion transporters, proteins involved in sodium and potassium transport. So some of those genes and some of those proteins have been mentioned before in relation to dehydration or to water conserve uh, mechanisms in the kidneys. But there are a bunch of uh, genes that either nobody knows what they do or they may be involved or maybe not. Uh, so it, it's very tricky to pick one gene and, and, and tell what it does and if it's you know, the most important gene for the comments, for example. So uh, at what point are you going to get enough data or have you, you know, gotten enough data to figure out what's what's going on with the camel during these times? I guess that's a very, very difficult question to answer because uh, we have no idea. That's that's a real answer. We have no idea whether we mm-hmm. will ever have enough data to tell this is the gene. This is the one that, you know, regulates everything because that's unlikely to be happening, to be honest. Some of the guys in the lab are working on the uh, hypothalamic transcriptomes of the camel. Same camels, but they're looking at the brain and how the hypothalamus regulates body body fluid uh, homeostasis. And perhaps in that area, it might be slightly easier uh, to find specific genes and proteins that regulate, you know, that, that may act as master regulators. Although this is a you know, this is a, a very big statement, I know many people won't agree with that. Because, but yeah, it's very difficult to say. We've got the data, and it's just a matter of time. Uh, we'll find the gene that makes you know magic happen. That, that's very unlikely. But we're just unraveling mechanisms, new genes, new pathways that. Well, what, again, might what be, is might it, be what, what is it doing? You said it's. it's- Making the membrane, I guess, more permeable, supposedly, or less permeable, not as yeah. rigid, but but literally, what's happened? So in this case, there are a few things going on. When you reduce cholesterol, the membrane because becomes less rigid, so it's more fluid. So one of the things that we find is that sodium diffuses back into the blood more easily. For example, another another protein, another ion transporter that we looked at was the a, a potassium rectifier that moves potassium from the kidney into the cell to compensate all the ions that are coming into the body again. Uh, and that specific protein seems to be directly affected by cholesterol. So cholesterol molecules bind this potassium transporter and they change the conformation. And either, you know, if there is more cholesterol, there is less potassium moving across. If you reduce cholesterol, more potassium moves across the membrane. And also, as I said before, one that was very interesting because this protein has been studied many, many times in relation to dehydration, which is a coporin tube that moves, moves water from the urine or pre-urine back into the body. This protein, a coporin tube, is accumulated in vesicles. And when you deplete cholesterol in the cell, all these vesicles kind of open up and all these coporins are trafficked into the membrane. And that means that a lot of water can pass through. So there are a few mechanisms where cholesterol might be involved. But again, this is also based on previous literature. We haven't proved empirically uh, whether that's actually happening in, in the kidney or not. But it's been previously described in, in either in TC cultures or in animal models. So that mechanism is happening. But we, it was a, a bit of out of scope of this project to, to look at that. I guess sort of, Next steps could be to find out whether in, in a model animal like a rat, for example, to knock out key genes involved in the cholesterol synthesis and see whether they cope in the same way with water deprivation or not. Okay. Are you able to uh, do anything in the field where you actually hang out with the camels and, and pet them and see them? And I know that it may or may not be important to your research, but I just wondered if you have any contact with the camels themselves. No, I unfortunately couldn't because I joined this project in 2019 and the samples were collected in 2016, if I'm correct. But one of the guys in the lab was there. And then that was, so this project is a collaboration between us, the United Arab University in, in, in the United Arab Emirates, 
So our colleagues there were taking care of all the animal work, so to speak. Okay. So at what point do you think you're going to uh, get to the bottom of this and figure out more of what's going on? Like how much longer do you need to uh, to work on this? Well, I guess, as I said before, I think that's that could go forever. So at, the, at this point, I'm running some uh, bioinformatics analysis. I'm trying to reconstruct the uh, regulatory network in the kidney of these scanners. And that, that's important because this, this type of studies very often go either pick a gene that we know well, we know what it does, and we look at what's going on with it in scanners in this case, or you pick the entire list and try to, to figure out which pathways are enriched. So you just simply using bioinformatic tools, you ask a software, take this list of genes and tell me which pathways are enriched uh, given the list. But that's, you know, either approach leaves behind a lot of information. So I'm now trying to reconstruct this regulatory network, which is basically uh, an attempt to, to, to look at what transcription factors and what proteins regulating transcription are important in the, in the kidney. So in a, in a way, it's an attempt to find those sort of master regulators. But there are, again, you know, tens of those. So it, it's very difficult to tell whether I, I, I will find out the, the solution in, in six months or in a year or in 10 years, mm. or if I will ever do this. Yeah, it, that's, it's very tricky. Well, as soon as you can, you have to find a place that has, uh, yeah. you know, even if it's like you're the zoo, camel rides and, and ride the camels and just think about them as you're, you know, as you... Yeah, I bet yeah. by being around them, you would you would start thinking about them a little bit differently, just hanging out with them for an hour or two, you know, yeah, something interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's something, one of the beauties of, of this uh, research is that now that our paper got out, camera researchers have a massive amount of information, massive amounts of data that they can use mm. to freely available to continue mining this data. And, you know, we don't know anything, so we, we don't know everything, so... Uh, maybe someone else with a different approach, with a different mindset, gets that data and finds something super interesting that we missed. That happens all the time. As you say, maybe people look at the at, at these animals a bit differently. You know, I guess most of the people don't see why camels might be so important, which I can understand. But these animals provide basic needs for millions of people in the Middle East, you know, on a daily basis. So they they are important for personal people. Is it just are they still just used to transport goods, or do people eat them, or what? You know, what are they used for nowadays? They they used to be beasts of burden many years ago. They've been used for food and milk ever since they were domesticated. And nowadays mm-hmm. they're also part of the culture and they're used for entertainment. There are camel races across the Middle East, sort of like a horse race in in Europe, uh, very popular. Yeah, similar to to those we've got in in, in Europe. Okay. Well, very good. Uh, Fernando, where can people find out more about your work and keep tabs on what you're learning? So uh, the paper was published in Communications Biology a few months ago. You can find the paper there. If it's too data dense, which definitely is, I was kindly asked to write a, a post for the native blog called Behind the Paper. So if you, if you look for yeah, camera research behind the paper in, in the native blog, you will find a, a little bit of a lay uh, explanation of the group and also of the paper. Uh, the group has also a Twitter account and a website that it's called vasopressing.org. You can find some common stuff in there and also some of the information regarding the other members of the group, which are who are doing very interesting research. Yeah, and feel free to visit those resources because they're very interesting. Okay, cool, very good. Well, Fernando, thank you for coming on the podcast, and uh, I hope you run into a camel soon that uh, it brings life to your research. Yeah, sure. If you allow me, just before we go, I'd like to thank you, uh, Abdu, uh, Abdu's group in the Emirates and Pamela Berger in, in Austria, collaborators, uh, and of course our funding bodies, the United Arab Emirates University and the Leverhin Trust for the general support. And you, of course, for inviting me today. It was uh, really nice chatting with you. Oh, yeah, same here. And for Man- Fernando, so thank you very much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hope you enjoy it. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. 
If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.